So welcome everyone to our Slow Art Day um, virtually for the 2021. So Slow Art Day is a global event with a simple mission to break the barriers um, between the general public and the gallery setting. The average time spent looking at artwork is usually only seven seconds. So this worldwide phenomenon of Slow Art Day is encouraging people to take their time. So the first um, artist that we are going to be looking at from the McMaster Museum of Art is John Hartman. Um, he was born in 1950 in Midland, Ontario and studied fine arts at McMaster University. He established his reputation with um, the exhibition Painting at the Bay at the McMichael um, Canadian Collection in 1993. These were large scale paintings like this one of Georgian Bay, sort of aerial views of the landscape painted with thick, um, rich paint. In the skies, Hartman paints stories about the places he's trying to depict, and he's continued to experiment with works that have combined figurative, narrative, and landscape. So we're just going to take a moment to, you know, as slow our day is, to look at this work. If you have any thoughts, feel free to jump in. I've always uh, really been drawn to color generally, but particularly in this artwork. And I'm very interested in how artists use it and how individuals react to it. Um, so at least in my opinion, for me, it, the, 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 the colors here draw me in and they make it seem really um, alive and vibrant, uh, but I, I'd be really interested to hear what other folks uh, feel if, if the color does anything for them too. I feel myself trying to like break apart each color because he uses so many variations of even the blues, but they're still, you can see they're separate um, in their strokes. So I find myself just nitpicking through the whole painting, trying to pick out the different shades. Yeah, I think this is a great piece for Slow Art Day um, because at first it just kind of looks like a abstract painting, but then when you actually take your time, like I see little figures like and boats in water and you can like really tell these little details that are in here that like if you don't spend more than seven seconds with, you probably wouldn't get. <laughs> Okay, so we can move on to the next one. Um, so this is by Matthew Berry called Winds of Change. Matthew Berry is also a native Hamilton um, artist whose work has been informed by intimate relationships with the outdoors um, from the age of 18. He concerns his observation of changing landscapes um, by further infusing his connection to color. He also studied at the McMaster University Visual Arts Program and his work has continued to investigate abstract painting influenced by his travels, his family history, and his interaction with the fortified areas built during World War II. So again, we can just take a couple moments and um, look at this painting and if you have any thoughts. This one is definitely a lot lighter in color than the other one. You could kind of tell the other one, the paint was really piled on there, but this one looks like lighter washes. Again, I'm going to jump in, and in no way do I intend to do any amount of talking here, but I'm going to do a couple of things. First, thank you for choosing this artwork, because I'm not sure that I have seen it before, or at least I haven't given it the amount of time that Slow Art Day can allow you to, to have, really to encourage you rather to have, to look at an artwork. But also I want to, uh, I, I'm interested to hear I noticed with the other artwork that you both sort of talked about, uh, of course, from your own experience as artists, right? And, and I don't really paint of any real way. Uh, so your looking is, is necessarily like different from my looking. So I find it very interesting, even just the way you were describing this about the different washes and different layers, uh, which I hadn't ever um, 
use that word when talking about oil painting on canvas. Uh, so I really appreciate hearing uh, your perspective on that. I'm curious, uh, to Lise here. Um, can you, everyone hear me? Yep. Yeah, okay. I am trying to like figure out what the scene is for me personally. <laughs> like sometimes when something's a little more abstract like the previous one, um, like Juliana said, I also like picked up kind of quickly on like the figures and water, people like jumping into the water. This one here, I feel like I have less of an understanding of really what it is. So I'm curious maybe what other people are interpreting here. I definitely am picturing some sort of like field scene or something more rural, maybe like an industri an old industrial building in the field scene. But I don't know, I would just be curious to see what other people are, or to hear what other people are seeing. Yeah, I kind of see like two different viewpoints here. Um, like the background kind of reminds me of when you're in a plane and you can see like separations of land and it's like different colors. Um, and then this, this part in the foreground um, with like the turquoise and the red, I like, it feels less of like a bird's eye view that I get from the background and more of like on the same plane as me. But yeah, I just, I don't really know what it is, but it's interesting having these two opposite views that I kind of like see from it. <laughs> That is so cool because as you were describing that, uh, my seeing was adjusting with your description. Um, and part of that adjustment that happened was, I don't know the name of it, but that shot that they will do in movies where the person in the foreground stays still, but in the background sort of zooms in, sort of the dramatic like zip kind of thing. And uh, like playing with the planes as you described. So, um, yeah, it's like the background is sort of from above, but perhaps this is my, you know, uh, wistfulness to not be able to be going out camping and stuff for the past year or two. So, but I'm reading this as like, I'm sort of on a little bit of a hill, uh, looking down on a picnic table that's got all of my camping gear sitting on it, like a, like a thermos and other, maybe my tent I haven't set up yet kind of thing. Uh, and it just seems sort of like a nice little ideal place for it to be because I can see the water and I can see the the greenery the forest the trees in the background um, which is interesting I think that's very much from my own you know mental place at the moment but uh, the way you describe that it it really sort of brought me into that with motion as well which I think was interesting It is I, I had the same um, feeling of like when Juliana was talking about being on the plane or like looking down, I like pictured myself on a plane. We all want to be on a plane <laughs> over the past year <laughs> looking down. But then at the same time, when you started describing that camping scene, I had that same motion of like to drain this table. So it's cool to listen how people interpret it. Uh, Jill, did you have any thoughts? I saw you. Um... <laughs> I was pretty much just going to say the same thing, but yeah, I think I almost see it more in the way that Juliana put it first. It's almost like this like tapestry or something of this overhead view of like the hit, like the road, the, the back roads or something or like Northern Ontario, it seems. Um, and then this foreground is like something positioned in front of it. It's almost like you can kind of see the shadow of it too, right along that white part on the, the right bottom side where it's like a picnic table with a bunch of stuff on it too. So it's kind of like, these, I'm seeing so many different perspectives now that people are mentioning it as well. It's interesting. For sure. These are some awesome observations. Yeah, I am drawn, I don't know. I keep going back and forth between these giant patches of watches and then the really saturated colors and trying to put them together.
Okay, I think we can move on to the third one. Okay, so this one's really different from what we just looked at, but this is a book of Persian miniatures. So I'll give a brief context. This is all like from the same page, um, but so the Persian empire had an extremely rich tradition of court painting and its various centers of royal patronage produced some of the greatest painters of all time. So specifically with this book comes from the late 18th and early 19th century. And this was during the Qajar dynasty where shahs or kings relied heavily on visual arts to solidify their position and promote their reputation in society. And artists worked with a range of media produce, producing manuscripts featuring these miniature paintings. So these, this dynasty was the first one to sort of combine the two and also used figures in their work. So we can kind of also take a moment and look at these. The, the detail in these miniature paintings is just like, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah, when I see these, like, I think action, I think chaos. I I also think of narrative, where like the other paintings, it was a little bit more up for interpretation, where like, obviously these have a narrative. And you can even see that, like, without knowing the history and just looking at the, the uh, paintings, like, you can tell that there is like, it's telling a story. Um, but yeah, they're amazing. <laughs> That's an awesome observation. Yeah, it does really, I'm sure with the poems, it reflects um, these kings or these people of higher class trying to preserve their, their stories, as you said. You know, maybe I'm, I'm just stuck on thinking about color because I like it. But uh, following the previous artwork, um, this shares a palette, at least, you know, from my mind's picture of the previous work. Um, I'm just sort of reflecting on the different ways these artists have used color between each other. Um, sort of those lighter areas of that sort of green, uh, which I think Matthew Very also had. And then those pops of that sort of very orangey warm red, uh, are like sprinkled around the work. I'm just, I haven't fully, I'm sorry, you can probably tell, I haven't fully formed an idea about the difference in how they're using the color, but I just noticed there's a, a similar palette and I'm just sort of tracing through it with my, my looking. For sure, these definitely feel more realist, but there's like a very fantastical element that comes through because of the color that is used. I'm sorry, Donna, is it cool for you to go to the slide with the, the close up again? Of course. Thank you. Oh, those animals are delightful. It is quite a comparison looking at very broad strokes and abstract looking at these super tiny paintings with these really, really definitive lines. Yeah, I really like that word too. Sorry, definitive line. Uh, go ahead. I think it was Jill was going to say something. Yeah, I was going to say like about the lines. Yeah, they're so they're so clear. It adds so much movement to the piece. Where it feels like my eyes kind of following. It almost feels like if I start to read the the poem that goes along with it, I'll be able to like follow these lines to all the depictions that are happening in these one scenes. It's really lovely. Yeah, I think it shows great movement, like not even just in the figures because they look like they're in motion, but also like the grass in the background with the lines. It makes everything feel very fluid. Awesome, okay. So that was our final piece, but we're gonna move on to talking about the McMaster um, 2021 uh, fourth year SUMA show. So for this year, we chose um, 
The fourth is shows the title Quixotic. And Quixotic means exceedingly idealistic and unrealistic and impractical, um, which I guess sort of sums up our year or we felt it did. Um, to get more information, you can check out our Instagram and our exhibition will be on April 29th with the time to be determined, but that'll all be up on our Instagram. Um, so me, Jill and Juliana are gonna briefly talk about our own art practices for Slow Art Day. So um, as Teresa said, my area of specialization is based in Persian studies with interdisciplinary art and strong foundations in painting. Geometry has always played a major role in my work as I focus on creating these patterns and designs. Um, I create these designs and patterns by painting on glass or engraving and laser cutting with acrylic sheets. Um, I've continued to advance my research into the myth mathematics and history of Middle Eastern designs, um, more specifically Persian designs. I primarily paint these designs on glass and acrylic because I like to use natural light and artificial light to push um, the reflections of the work beyond the work itself and activate the surrounding space. Um, so the one on the left is my laser engraving on an acrylic sheet, and then the one on the right is um, a painting on a glass sheet. So we can take a moment. Uh, I will admit that, of course, I saw some of your your images before your description just now, um, and it hurts my heart to not be able to see these in person, enlivened with light, the way you were describing, uh, because they're they're amazing to look at as they are. But with that extra piece of information, it sort of brings home to me the um, value what's added when you get to see an artwork in person. For sure. There is definitely, um, you know, capturing light with photography is very difficult to do sometimes. So, um, yeah, I think these pieces are a great example of taking that heritage that you have and combining it in like a modern sense where you're kind of putting yourself into the work by using like these colors, you get to pick these bright colors or the iridescent plexiglass. So it's a good combination tying like your, your heritage and yourself. Hey, I'm sorry, I'm dominating here, but I must ask. Um, I have never seen the word or heard of the technique under blossoms here. It says C-E-R-N-E relief. Um, oh, it's just a like outline that I, I first trace and then I paint inside. You can kind of see that gold outline over everything. Yeah, very cool. Oh yeah, I, I just love to learn new words and techniques and such. So I really appreciate you introducing me to that. Yeah, so it's just a, an out, a relief outline that you can kind of draw with and then put the paint on um but yeah because this paint is very um liquidy so you do need that sort of secure border I have awesome. a question about how oh sorry um how you would typically like display this because like Teresa said it'd be so nice to see this in person especially with working with light and glass and like I when I look at this feel inclined like I wish I could go behind it and see what it looks like on the back end so I'd just be curious like how how you would typically present it and if there are um, other angles of viewing it yeah so I think the one on the right is sort of the representation of course that one um, I would have them sort of just farther away from the wall so you could see that reflection more um, because I think the reflection does add like another sort of dimension to the work. And then, as you said, you can kind of move around it and see the reflections from different angles and the colors based off the light. Cool. Awesome. So next we have Jill and I'll let her take it away. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I was pretty introduced myself. I'm Jill Letton. Um, so for the past few years, my work has really involved around addressing climate change um, and that has translated into recent works where I have continued to 
combine our research to contextualize archival images um, and images of climate change printed through us uh, through the media um, into a contemporary context through digital manipulation. So the work I have been creating now starts with the digital collage, um, which I translate into medium scale acrylic paintings um, that visualize environments or spaces with realistic or surrealistic elements. Um, and at the moment, my, I'm really critiquing um, the 1950s industrial revolution um, or revolutions as a key period of modern economic growth um, and the start of a dominating capitalist mindset that really has significantly impacted the state of the global environment. Um, and it was this kind of unrealistically idealized period that really significantly contributed to how our global society has socially and systematically embraced capitalistic and mass consumerist values. Um, so, you know, looking at thriving industries like uh, fast fashion or even how the news cycles work, um, it's not often that we stop and examine the state of the world uh, to make meaningful changes. We're quite manipulated by these uh, powerful systems and industries not really engage with these topics. Um, and this is quite thematic in my work, like my piece on the uh, right delivery. I'm critiquing uh, e-commerce practices, um, specifically Amazon, for the ways in which they incentivize consumers to buy individual and cheaply priced uh, items with low to no cost shopping, uh, shipping um, for goods that are not often sustainably sourced um, and therefore are pressurizing delivery systems and manufacturing systems to operate at faster and faster rates to um, satisfy consumer demands, which is of course taxing on the environment. Um, and to bring it back to this theme of rapid environmental degradation um, comes through with this piece on the left titled uh, Watching the World Burn, which is actually the first painting I had ever completed for the series that I'm still currently working on. Um, and this piece I feel very much is like an encompassing or grounding artwork in my current practice. Um, I view this house on the left edge of the painting as kind of representative of the world, you know, up in flames to kind of indicate the destruction of the environment while these onlooking figures who represent so many of the global population, especially these larger powerful industries who are just kind of idly watching or turning a blind eye to the severity of the situation. Um, and just to speak compositionally to um, these pieces and other works from the series, my aim in combining a variety of recognizable imagery into these surreal kind of set-like scenes um, and deconstructing and disorienting space by uh, cutting planes and perspectives with these wall facades is sort of to reorient the viewer into these topics and narratives um, that I'm looking into for each work. And like this division of space and these facades are kind of meant to be uh, symbolic to these veils that society puts up so that these pieces aim to almost kind of pull back that kind of curtain, so to speak, to deconstruct the facade, put on top of serious conversations about global issues and hopefully provide a little space for people to kind of reflect on their own position, uh, positionality in these topics. So yeah, we did that. <laughs> I, the Amazon packages, I just, <laughs> it's, you just see them everywhere. And I, I like, even now, I remember my brother ordered something from Amazon. It was like a battery or something. And they put it in this ridiculously large box. You open it and there's just this little battery. And it's just, it's crazy what's happening to the world because of it. For real. Yeah, it's true. It's, it's like, you think of all the, it's, it, there's so many layers to it too, right? You have all these, the land being taken over for these giant factories, basically. And then you have the manufacturing sides of things, the distribution sides of things, how things are being packaged. Yeah, it's totally same. <laughs> it's frustrating when you know there are better ways to handle these practices and it's just chosen not to. I was reading an article about how Amazon's like returns process is a whole environmental crisis because it's cheaper for them to throw it away than to actually like process the return, which is crazy because it's a perfectly good product. It is, yeah. Totally. But your line work here almost reminds me slightly of the miniature Persian paintings and that you just have these very fine detail lines that sort of draw the eyes around the work. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. Interesting. <laughs> I like what um, you've done with the person delivering the Amazon package. Like it doesn't look like regular Joe in a, in a truck delivering packages, but he's like in more of a uniform, um, which I think is interesting. And the shadow or the reflection, it almost looks like he could be, I don't know if this is your intention, but like part of a military 
or something and like the shadow we looks like it could be like a rifle or a gun and which I think is interesting your um I don't know your take on this because it's almost like the war of like what's happening versus the environment yeah I've actually gotten that feedback a few times it's so funny because mm. I didn't necessarily like and it wasn't my intention to do that but then afterwards after seeing it now I'm like oh my gosh it totally does look like it and then I've gotten a few comments too which I totally agree with it kind of has this war like scene to it like this kind of dusty uh deconstructed kind of blown out look of like a, a war lands or something um but I think it yeah I think there's so much more meaning to that when you think about it uh kind of at war <laughs> with ourselves in a sense too um and just also with other uh, global scale in terms of how these practices are being taken up yeah thank you um I'm going to see if I can summarize because I've uh, got a few thoughts here, but I, I love how folks have been talking about color and line, uh, but also I'm picking up a lot on the contrast and by that I mean like literally within the elements of the artwork, but then also sort of figuratively with, with thoughts and by that I'm thinking of, you mentioned a war on ourselves, uh, I was also enjoying the, the car and the person and the way they're dressed as evocative of an, you know, older time period and contrasting, juxtaposing, or like interrupting a thought process of something very modern with heavily nostalgia, nostalgicized, I just made up a word, period <laughs> of history. Um, and and it, it's always very interesting to me how art and artists can, with just a that kind of twist, that kind of change, that kind of insertion, can tell reams of stories. Um, so that contrast is happening there too, I think. And uh, complemented, of course, by the color and, and the line and how you're using sort of that smoked out, smoothed out background. And then those are very precise geometric uh, lines for, I'm looking at the one, sorry, specifically on the right delivery uh, for the wall there. I, I just really am enjoying how you use contrast here. And I'm wishing that I could use this as an example to teach people about how artists use contrast in their work. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, contrast is really it, like something I think about quite deeply because I'm using um, archival images that are from the 1950s. They're not often colorized mostly at all. Um, and so I think to try to, I've been paying a lot of attention to how can I, how can I bring these 1950s narratives into a contemporary context so that people will still want to engage with them, um, but also still kind of adding in that element that these, you know, this concept of you know, climate change and the practices that we're doing haven't really changed, right? Um, so kind of finding these black and white images, but then also contrasting with this kind of almost toxic kind of uh, digital brightness with these uh, very vibrant colors. Um, yeah, so contrast is definitely something I, I, I very much think about. So thank you so much for it. Awesome. So I think we can move on to Juliana Bernacki now. So Juliana, take it away. Okay. Um, so uh, my current art practice combines painting and hand needle punched rugs to create these like dynamic diptychs. Um, I'm really interested in challenging the conventions of painting in traditional diptychs or triptychs. As you can see here with the piece display and spying on the left, um, I use trapezoid shaped canvases that all fit together um, to create like a conventional square, but to break them apart, they are trapezoid shaped canvases. Uh, conceptually, my work revolves around themes of voyeurism, privacy and individual projection of self image through space. I'm interested in deconstructing all these themes through my work and then presenting them as ambiguous spaces that are simultaneously familiar. So my piece, Disassociation, on the right-hand side is a piece I did at the end of my third year, um, which kind of sparked this whole new idea for my work. 
Uh, this piece was about the internal feeling of disassociation that I often felt at times as, when I was a child. And I aim to make this composition disorienting as it translates to feeling, as that translates to the feeling of disassociation. Here I also started working with ambiguous spaces and combining inside and outside spaces that I also did for my other piece on the left. So for Display and Spying, it's a piece I completed this year. I was inspired by when I took walks um, in the neighborhood around my apartment and I felt almost like compelled to look inside people's windows. Um, like they would have their blinds open, their lights on. And I was trying to, to figure out if, it, if that's an invitation to look inside, if they want you to see, you know, their beautifully staged house, or if I was like spying on these individual micro lives of these people. Um, so that opened up a big, uh, concept for me to explore that which I've been doing this year and then this piece I made the little rug um, window symbol in the center and then the pieces that go along with this in the series also have corresponding rugs so yeah <laughs> awesome it's interesting because like you normally you're not supposed to touch paintings in a gallery setting, but a rug, you know, you're so used to just going like, you know, that feeling. And so you almost just want to go to the center of your painting and just almost touch it. And I like that you've always like, you've always used, utilized your borders of, the paint, of your paintings, which I think is a very unique um, part of your work. Yeah. And with the rugs, I think it's interesting because playing with inside and outside spaces, um, rugs are meant to be like inside, but now I'm taking like it out from outside the painting and bringing it like inside the gallery space or inside the viewing space, mm -hmm. so. I think too, like the use of these, um, the, 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 the canvas shapes and how you have this middle part of it open, everything's kind of drawing into the center and then this window space is almost kind of like a, like a target or something. So all all of my eyes is kind of going straight into the centerpiece, which I think really speaks into that idea of, of kind of being compelled and to look into someone's window. Um, but I think that's like a really key part in this, making the viewer kind of simultaneously experience that with this, with this artwork. Thank you. When you were talking about using space, like I felt the click go off in my brain, um, quite specifically with the work on the left. And I, I, there's so many elements about it that make me feel watched in the center. When you told the story about walking through your neighborhood with the people with the folks, the curtains open and the lights on, the perfectly emanating warmth and you can see, you know, their big screen TV and such. And it's interesting that you described it that way about invitation, because I thought, I thought about that too. When I walk by those, I'm like, ooh, that's, ew, should I be looking in and oh, you can't help it. They're watching the game or whatever on TV. And you can see, you know, someone walks over and hands somebody else a, a coffee. You know what I mean? It's, um, it's very interesting. So it's, the real life example and then the way I'm looking at and thinking about your work, it's very interesting who's doing the looking here and who's then in the position of the power of the looking. Uh, as you say, are they inviting you to look in or are they just, whoops, you shouldn't be looking in. It's, it's, it's interesting. I'm, I'm navigating through it right now. Thank you. I'm really interested by the, when you look inside of, each of the yellow squares into like I guess elements of the house you just like lightly drew them with lines you didn't add in any detail kind of leaving that part up to the person's imagination of what would you see if, as you're walking by you're looking into people's houses and you know I'm just noticing now I'm sorry I just looking at the one on the left I'm sorry uh even the title displaying spying the sort of position that that puts the looker in. Um, yeah, I wonder about that. 
I'm the kind of person that draws their curtains as soon as it gets any degree of dark, but <laughs> I know that not everybody does. So it's very interesting to um, navigate through that. Uh, yeah, and, and again, with contrast and the way that you're using color here, it's very interesting. And I guess if I could see it in real life texture as well. Okay, so if no one has anything else and we talked through all the paintings, that was our last painting for today. Um, I guess thank you for coming and participating with us for Slow Art Day. Uh, if you have want to see more art this coming next coming weeks, uh, our SUMA show will be up April 29th, so feel free. Um, and more information will be up on our Instagram at McMaster SUMA 2021. But thank you. Well, thank you all so much. Let me turn my camera on. Just there we go. <laughs> thank you all so much for for putting this together, doing all this work, sharing this uh, so generously with us. I know I very much enjoyed our walk through some of the work from the collection, but also your own work too. And like I said, it makes my heart a little bit sad that uh, we can't be seeing textures and colors and light uh, in, in real life. But I know that I will certainly be um, uh, keeping my eyes peeled for where you will be showing your work in the coming years. Uh, fingers crossed we can all go and see that in uh, real life and reality. I'm just going to point you all to um, one of our participants, Gloria Allen, has posted in the chat. Um, and I, I learned a lot today too, Gloria. I'm sorry, I got to clear my throat. Uh, I learned a lot today too, and I really appreciated chatting with everyone. Uh, I just want to uh, encourage if any of our presenters today have websites or uh, links to anything that you think would be good for us all to know, please feel free to pop that in the chat. Um, I want to make sure people have a chance to engage further with your content, your wonderful ideas and artwork. Uh, and I'll just leave this Spot. Thank you, Donna. Uh, I'll leave a few minutes open at the end here, just in case there's any sort of summa summary quotes, uh, anything that you would like to leave us on. Um, I just put my website in the chat. Um, if Julian and Jill have anything they can put in, you can always check it out, contact us through um, our social media or that, and see some of the work that's going to be produced. Thank you for sharing. Uh, I know that that uh, Instagram websites, these are ways that I love to um, interact with and, and keep on top of information about artists and art that I really enjoy. Uh, so again, I thank you all very, very much for your time. Thank you for everyone who has attended. Deeply appreciate it. And uh, I hope that you can carry forward ideas of Slow Art Day. Um, and stay tuned, of course, for the Sumo Show, the Quixotic exhibition that you all have coming up on the 29th. Uh, you can, okay, I'm sorry, got to clear my throat. It's like my throat knew that I had to speak today and it decided to throw me a, a wrench here. Uh, you can keep updated, of course, at those links, uh, the McMaster Museum links as well, or social media. I hopefully look forward to seeing you around the internet over the next few months or so. Uh, and yes, thanks again for organizing and delivering such a wonderful Slow Art Day experience to us all. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.